right. Right, dinosaurs, probably the most asked question we get from little children, but also from adults. I'm gonna start off with a quote, something that a guy wrote, one of these bloggers on the internet a couple of years ago. Have a look, a listen, a read, what he said concerning dinosaurs. He said, dinosaurs were my gateway drug to atheism. And while I was still six or seven years away from reaching the conclusion that God either didn't care about us or didn't exist, the dinosaurs had shared an important secret. And what was that secret? That the Bible can be wrong. Now, why did he say that? Why is it that dinosaurs proved him that the, that the Bible is wrong? It is because according to science, this is what happened. Billions of years ago, there was this Big Bang explosion with the stars, the planets that formed the world. Then life started very simple, more and more complex. Millions of years ago, the dinosaurs came into existence. They died out 65 million years ago. And only later on did human beings arrive on the scene. Now, let's start from the Bible. I'm thinking from the Bible. What does the Bible have to say concerning this? If we read Genesis 1, it says in six literal 24-hour days, God created everything by just speaking everything into being, which means, as I said earlier, that the dinosaurs were created on day six of creation. Now, just something technical, a dinosaur is a land-living creature that walks around with its legs under its body, you know, like a cow would walk or a dog or something like that. A crocodile technically isn't a dinosaur because its body is hanging between its legs. That's just something... Um, technical. So this is, these are dinosaurs. Those are not dinosaurs. Those are flying reptiles, and these are marine reptiles. But these days, I mean, if the children see those things, that's a dinosaur. But that's just on the side there. Right, so now I've got a question for you. Does God tell us in so many words in the Bible when he made Tyrannosaurus rex? Does it say there, when he made Tyrannosaurus rex? Let's have a look at a couple of options. Millions of years ago, 6,000 years ago, it's impossible to know when they left, or dinosaurs never existed. Now, which one is the correct answer? B, if you start from the Bible, you will see that if you add up the genealogies, more or less everything was created around about 6,000 years ago, that God spoke everything into being. So, the idea that Fred Flintstone lived with the dinosaurs is not that far-fetched. <laughs> Now, you will not find the word dinosaur in the Bible. So don't take your Bible tonight and, where is that dinosaur? You won't find the word dinosaur in the Bible. When the Bible came out, one of the first prominent English translations of the Bible was the King James Version in 1611. In that Bible, you will not find the word dinosaur. The word dinosaur was the first time coined in 1841 by a guy with the name of Sir Richard Owen. He was the curator at the British Natural History Museum. And back in his days, about 200 years ago, they built roads and, and um, buildings, and they dug into the ground to lay the foundations. And the more they dug into the ground, the more fossils they discovered. And they realized, listen, these things are the remains of creatures that lived at some stage in the past. They were huge. And if you look at the bones, the skeletons, they look like these big lizard-like creatures. So let's call them dinosauros. It's two Greek words, which means terrible lizard. In Afrikaans, skrik akadis. <laughs> so these big, terrible lizards roamed the earth at some stage in the past. They didn't know when. So literally for 230 years, you will not find the word dinosaur in the Bible because it didn't exist. Now, the 1611 King James translation, you will find a word in that Bible 35 times in the Old Testament that if you take that word out and you substitute it with the word dinosaur, it actually fits pretty well. Now, what word could that be? I'm going to show you a picture of it. What is that? That is a dragon. As I said, 35 times in the Old Testament. I'm not speaking about the dragon in Revelation. I'm talking Old Testament. Book of Psalms, book of Isaiah, I'll show you a couple of verses. If you go to Kum Books today and you buy the latest King James Version, you will not find the word dragon 35 times in that Bible anymore. You will only find it 16 times. They've changed it 19 times. And most of your English, English translations today, uh, modern English Bible translations, you will find the word dragon in the Old Testament zero times. They 
changed it 35 times. Most of the times they changed it to the word jackal. Yes. Go Google it. Now, why did this happen? It is because over the years, Bible translators came across the word dragon in the Old Testament and they immediately thought, well, this can't be a dinosaur because, you know, they died out millions of years ago. Must be something like a jackal. And they literally changed the name. So they were influenced already by the world. Let's look at a couple of verses where you will still find the word dragon. Isaiah 27, it says, And he, God, will slay the dragon that is in the sea. Isaiah 30, verse 6, it says, From where come the lioness and the lion, the adder and the flying fiery serpent? In some of the translations, it talks about a flying fiery dragon. In the book of Psalms, it says, You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. So these references specifically to dragons in the Old Testament is just what we would call today dinosaurs. They just had a different word for it. And then we get this one. This is the zoo of the Bible, the end of the book of Job. God comes to Job and is, he asks him a couple of questions. And there's 10 creatures God refers to. He mentions them there by name and mostly they are being described and the description fits perfectly with that creature, the lion, the raven, the mountain goat, the deer, the wild donkey, wild ox, ostrich, horse, hawk, eagle. Nobody's got a problem with that. Then we get to Job 40. And now God tells Job, look at the behemoth which I made as I made you. Now the people say, whoa, what is that? Now that is the Hebrew word which literally means the beast of beasts. Now, some Bible translators came along and they said, well, we don't know what a behemoth is, but it talks about the beast of beasts. So this is a very big thing. So maybe this is either a hippopotamus or an elephant. So they actually, there's, sometimes you find footnotes or in the main text, even the old Afrikaans translation, they change it already to a sequi, a hippopotamus. But I think what's important to remember is that God's word is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Footnotes are man-made. So we have to be careful concerning footnotes. But then the description follows. And let's see if the description fits with a hippopotamus or an elephant or what's going on here. God tells Job that this creature, he makes his tail stiff like a cedar tree. So if you look at this creature, look at its tail, the first thing that comes to mind is a mighty big cedar tree. Now, if you don't know what a cedar tree looks like, here is one that washed up in America a couple of years ago, 65 meters long. Massive trees. I mean, Job lived in the Middle East. He knew what a cedar tree was. 72 times the Old Testament refers to the cedars of the Lebanon. This is the flag of Lebanon with a cedar tree. So Job knew what a cedar tree looked like. God says this creature's got a tail like a cedar tree. Right, so let's compare this now to the tail of an elephant. <laughs> you think it fits? You know what? Gets worse with the hippopotamus. Look at that thing. <laughs> Man, you can't even call that thing a tail. So it is not a hippopotamus. It is not an elephant. But from the fossil record, we know there were creatures that lived some stage in the past. If you look at the fossils and you, you put the skeleton together, they had huge tails. Like, for instance, the sauropod dinosaurs. There's a person for scale. Now that compares much better with that. And the interesting thing is this drawing is drawn wrong because nowhere, everywhere on earth, we find those fossilized footprints, that creature where he walked in the mud, but nowhere has it ever been found that he dragged his tail in the mud behind him on the ground. So we suspect this tail was actually held up horizontally in the air, probably to balance out with the weight of its neck at the front. Let's look at its... Uh, the, the following description, God says, His bones on the inside of his body are tubes of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. So just the front limb of that creature, that's what it looked like. Massive. Massive. And God carries on. He says, He is the first of the works of God, which means in context, He is number one. Of all the land creatures I made, He is the biggest. So I can't prove it to you, but it sounds like as if God is describing a sauropod dinosaur to Job. And he says, there he is, standing next to the river. I made him along with you. There he is. Then we get to Job 41. And God says, can you draw out Leviathan? Now, most Bibles change it to crocodile. Let's see if the description fits. It says, can you draw him out with a fish hook? 
His sneezings flash forth light. Out of his mouth go flaming torches. Sparks of fire leap forth. Out of his nostrils comes forth smoke as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals and a flame comes forth from his mouth. And God says he lives in the water. The scales are packed tightly on his back. The people said, well, it must be a crocodile. Well, I've never seen a fire-breathing crocodile, but the Bible speaks of sea monsters and sea dragons. So it, could, it is some kind of a sea-living creature that spewed flames. That's what the Bible says. But the people think this is mythical. You know, in the beginning, yeah, an ox and a, and a raven and an eagle, Job um, 38, 39, that's fine. But Job must have, you know, Job 40, Job 41, he doesn't know what's going on there anymore. But these are real creatures that God is describing to Job. Now, these descriptions, specifically of the land dinosaurs, we get those descriptions and, and references to them in the Bible after Noah's flood, which means that land-living dinosaurs had to be on Noah's ark to survive the flood. But now this sounds really ridiculous. And you know why this sounds ridiculous, you know, dinosaurs on the ark? Let me show you why people, Christians, believe that dinosaurs were not on the ark. It's because of this. Children Bible pictures that are drawn wrong. Have you ever seen a children Bible picture of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden together with a dinosaur? No, you don't see it. Have you ever seen a children Bible picture with the ark drawn correctly? No, that is wrong. That is not what the Bible says. Have you ever seen dinosaurs going into the ark? No, you don't see it. Why not? Because the people who draw these pictures have been evolutionized by the world, thinking dinosaurs died out millions of years ago, so I can't draw them in the Bible. What does the Bible has to say about the size of the ark? 135 meters long, 13 meters tall, 23 meters across. A huge seafaring vessel. So that's why the world, they come to us Christians and they tell us, you know, you Christians are so stupid. Your ark is too small. Do you know how big a dinosaur get? They will never fit into that ark. What should we Christians, what should our response be? What does the Bible say? Now, what does it say? As I just mentioned, 135 meters by 23 by 13, huge vessel. If you draw it on scale, it looks like this. There are people standing there. That's the kind of thing we should put in children's Bibles because we show our kids the wrong pictures. They go to university or school. They, they learn about dinosaurs. Well, dinosaurs live, but the Bible says they were created. And they six, the children's Bible, they're not there. Mom, what's going on? I think I'm an atheist. This is just stories. It's literally what's happening. If you look at the volume, oh, maybe I should just mention this. 1994, South Korean sea naval architects decided to go and work out what is the most optimal dimensions that you must build a ship in so that it is very, very stable on the deep sea? And guess what is the ratio they discovered? The most optimal ratio? The dimensions of the ark. They worked out the ark that's 13 meters tall would have been very, very stable in an ocean where the waves were 30 meters tall, almost three times as high. That's why they built all the big, seafaring ships, oil tankers on the dimensions of Noah's Ark. Very interesting. How did Noah know that? Let's look at the volume. <clears throat> you can fit 522 of those rail carriages inside it. Now, if you fill one of those carriages with sheep, the amount that's allowed according to the SPCA, you know, enough room around them and so forth, you multiply that with 522 carriages, you can stock the Ark with 125,000 sheep. That's how much space there is on the ark. Now, how many animals did Noah have to take onto the ark? The Bible talks about kinds, not species. For instance, the dog kind. We believe included dogs, jackals, wolves, coyotes, and dingoes because the secular scientists, they've written this up in a scientific journal. All those creatures can crossbreed with each other and they all go back to an original mother and father, some kind of a wolf-like creature. Same thing for cats. You get 36 cat species today on earth, but they can all crossbreed with each other, and they all go back to a single male and female at some stage in the past. It's been scientifically proven. So God only sent two wolf-like creatures onto the ark. Not all the jackal species, wolf species, dog, great breeds, and so forth. Two cats, two wolf-like creatures, two elephants, two kangaroos, two bears, two whatever. So if you take two of every kind of the creatures that's alive today, including those that died out, including the dinosaurs, we worked out more or less 8,000 kinds of creatures. Some creationists even say even less, 
Uh, we only, only 5,000 kinds, but let's say 8,000 kinds. So 8,000 males, 8,000 females, that will give you about 16,000 animals. And if you look at the adult size, only 11% of those creatures on earth would have been bigger than a sheep. So let's say they were all the size of a sheep. You only need space for 16,000 sheep. And as you can put 125,000 sheep on that ark. So there were more than enough space on the ark. What people don't always realize is that very few of the dinosaurs grew to be exceptionally big. Only a few of them. The vast majority of dinosaurs were very, very small. In fact, they worked out that the average size of an adult dinosaur were about the size of a sheep. All dinosaurs, as far as we know, hatched from eggs. That is the biggest fossilized dinosaur eggs they've ever discovered. So even the biggest dinosaur at some stage in his life was very, very small. So keep that in mind. And then also this is a secular study that was done on the Apatosaurus. Now the Apatosaurus is the dinosaur with the long neck and the long tail. Now when you go into the field and you go cut the tree down, you can count the tree rings. And you can count them and work out more or less how old the tree is. I don't know if you know that. That's how we determine the age of a tree. More or less the same kind of thing you can do with reptiles because reptiles never stop growing. Even the of others and the tortoises and the turtles today alive. They keep growing until the day they die. So literally the biggest crocodile on earth is probably the oldest crocodile on earth. So similar thing in their bone structure, you can look at growth patterns. So what they did was the Apatosaurus, they discovered that for the first four or five years of its life, it didn't gain much in weight. But yet at about five years of age, it went through a teenage growth spurt for about six years where it gained five and a half tons a year. That is 500 kilograms a month. Now you think you're struggling with your weight. <laughs> Yo. And then after about 12 years, it, it flattened off again, the curve. So we think that God sent young animals to the ark because young animals were smaller. They took up less space. They weigh less. They ate less. Less waste to clean. They sleep most of the time because what are you going to do on the ark all of that time? They handle much better. You can put them in cages, stack these cages on top of each other. They recover faster from sicknesses, diseases, broken bones, and so forth. But the number one reason for sending young animals on the ark is what? After they survive the flood, they must repopulate the earth. So it, no sense in taking Opa and Oma elephant on the ark. They're too big. They eat too much, and there's not going to be baby elephants afterwards. So this is the kind of pictures we should show our children. Right size, young animals, including dinosaurs, going into the ark. Let's look at something like this. If you look at those skulls, would you say, is that the same species, or are those three different species? I mean, what's the logical answer? Different ones. It's the same one. That is a greyhound, Vintont. That's a bulldog. And that is a Rottweiler. So just to show you the enormous variety in genetics that God made those original creatures with, that he sent to the ark, to afterwards, when they got off the ark, they had that ability to diversify in all the variety that we see today through, by means of natural selection, survival of the fittest, adaptation, and so forth. In fact, I think it's 400, but I could be wrong, maybe 300 different dog breeds alone that we have today. That's just the power in genetics. So the problem with fossils is the following. Fossils do not have labels on them. So if you dig up a fossil, you have to give it a name and come up with all these ideas where it came from and what it did and so forth. So the problem is the following. This is the same species, but they gave it three different species name, names because when it they dig it up, it looks like that. It's a young one. They give it a, a certain name. When it's a teenager, it's growing this dome on its head. It still has the horns. And when it's an adult, it loses the horns, but it only has this dome on its head. But when you dig those three out and you put them next to each other, they look like three different species. That's why they give them three different species names. So even the secular scientists admit that about a third of all dinosaur names have been given double to creatures. They should get rid of the names. There's just too many names. If you look, for instance, at the Ceratopsia kind, we believe this is all the same kind, but again, different species. The most famous one, I think, is Triceratops, but some of them have horns, some of them don't have horns, some of them have these neck shields, big ones, small ones, and so forth. It's just massive variety, but we believe that was 
a one kind from where all these different species came from. So if you take all the land living dinosaurs that went onto the ark, and our guys went to different museums, look at all the different kinds of dinosaurs, and we grouped them in kinds. Those with the long necks and the long tails, one kind. Those that look like T-Rex, another kind. Those that look like whatever, Stegosaurus, whatever, another kind. Our guys came to the conclusion there were only something like 50 different kinds on the ark. So 50 males, 50 females, that's 100 individuals, let's say the size of a sheep, 100 sheep, we can fit them in easily in this room. So there were more than enough space on the ark to fit the animals. But then the world comes to us and they tell us, oh, you've got a problem, you Christians, you are so stupid. Have you ever seen the teeth of T-Rex? That thing will clean your ark within a week. <laughs> now, just because animals have got sharp teeth doesn't mean they are meat eaters. It means that they have sharp teeth because God created them with sharp teeth to eat their food. So if I show you these pictures, I mean, logically, are those carnivores or are those herbivores? Sharp teeth must be carnivores. No, they're all herbivores. First one is a fruit bat. The second one is a panda bear. It's got exactly the same teeth structure than a polar bear, which exclusively eats seals. And this one is a Chinese water bug. Yes. They grow those teeth during the breeding season. They grow horns, they grow teeth, and they fight with the teeth. And then they fall out again. So it depends on with which worldview you are looking at the evidence. If you look at the sharp teeth from a biblical worldview, we know that scripture tells us, God told the animals, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. So originally, everything were herbivores. But because of the curse, probably then it started already that some of these animals started to eat each other. So it depends on with which worldview you are looking at the evidence. That will determine what you see in the evidence. Right, so that's what Scripture has to say concerning dinosaurs. It doesn't use the word dinosaur in the Bible. It uses the word dragon in the Bible. The Bible teaches us that God created them on day six. They were there. They were on the ark. They came off the ark. So that's what the Bible has to say. Let's now have a look at what the world has to say. Famous historians, books, same famous people that lived in the past. We're going to start off with this guy. He's called Alexander the Great. 300 years before Christ, he had this big army and he wanted to conquer the world. So at one stage, he went to India. And very, something very interesting that happened in India. Now, John Gill is a very famous Bible commentator of the 1700s. Now, John Gill spoke about a guy called Alihanes, and this is what Alihanes wrote. He says, Alihanes speaks of a dragon in India, which when it perceived Alexander's army near at hand, gave such a prodigious hiss and blast that it greatly frightened and disturbed the whole army. And Alexander the Great himself says that the thing's eyes were the size of a Macedonian shield. I don't know how big a Macedonian shield is, but he said he and his military, his army, they estimated the length of the dragon at 35 meters, from the tip of his snout to the tip of his tail. So the people living in the village said there's a cave outside of town. In the cave, there's a dragon. Please don't kill the dragon. So Alexander said, I won't kill your dragon. But they walked past the cave entrance. It seems like they made such a noise that it woke the dragon from his sleep. He came out of the, out of the cave and he saw him. So that's what he says. He saw Another guy, Marco Polo, traveled about 800 years ago, specifically there in the East China, and this is what he said. I get a journal. He said, in this province live huge snakes and serpents. They have enormous heads and eyes so bulging that they are bigger than loaves. Their mouth is big enough to swallow a man at one gulp. Their teeth are huge. They go to the dens where lions and bears and other beasts of prey have their cubs and gobble them up, parents as well as young. And as I said, uh, reptiles never stop growing. The Bible says before the flood, human beings grew up to about a thousand years old. After the flood, there was this drastic drop in age until where we are today, 70, 80, and so forth. But in the beginning, God allowed them to reach literally a thousand years. Now, if he allowed humans to grow that old, maybe he also allowed creatures to grow that old. So can you imagine the size of a thousand year old puff adder? It will look something like this. Now, this is the vertebra of an uh, anaconda. 
a living one. That is a fossilized vertebrate of a snake. If you draw it according to scale, that's what it would look like. That's a man standing there. That's the size they grew according to the fossil record. So massive big things that roamed the earth at some stage. Marco Polo lived in China for about 17 years, and he spoke about the emperor of China back in the days who grew dragons. And then he would line them up, attach them to his wagon, and the dragons would draw the emperor's dragon through the streets of the town, and the people would line the city streets to come and have a look at the emperor's dragon. And he said, no man or beast could draw close to these things without fear. That was 800 years ago. 400 years ago in the um, Chinese history books, it's written down. This really happened. The emperor created the post of a royal dragon feeder 400 years ago. Seems like there were still dinosaurs walking in China. I mean, if you look at the themes lots of times in China, this one, for instance, the moon calendar of China, 12 months, 12 creatures, one for every month. We recognize all these creatures, but one doesn't seem to fit. That thing looks like a dragon. What is the dragon doing there between all those other creatures? So it seems like it was a real creature. The dragon puppets, dragon boat racing, that theme in China, Japan, that area. They found this skull a couple of years ago. They dug it up. There's a side view. That's a front view. They called it Dracurex. Comes from the word dragon because they said when you look at this thing, it looks like a dragon. They gave the skull to the artist at National Geographic. They said, here is the skull. Draw a picture of what you think this thing looked like. And this is what the artist drew. And it was put on the front cover of that year's, that month's magazine. Right, let's move to the east, Cambodia. The Tapro Temple, 800 years old. The Buddhist built it, carved out of solid rock. It's overgrown with plants today, big tourist attraction. And on these walls, you get a lot of carvings of creatures and things like that. And you find something like this. Now, it looks like a creature. There's the head. There's the body. There's the tail. There are the legs and things on the back. Now, I can't prove it to you, but that thing looks like what kind of a dinosaur? A stegosaurus. So the only way, if that is a stegosaurus, the only way this guy that carved it out, knew what a stegosaurus looked like. He had to see one. Because even the fossil record only shows you the bones. But he carved it, what it looked like on the outside. Let's move to Australia. North Queensland, the Aborigines, they spoke about a creature called the Yaru. Now, they never saw the creature. They only told stories that their grandparents and great-grandparents, you know, over time from one generation to the next told them. But they, they gave the description to an artist. The artist drew this thing. There's the head. There's the neck body with four swim flippers. And again, that thing looks pretty close to a plesiosaurus. If you think of the Loch Ness Monster in Scotland, the Scots are convinced it's a plesiosaurus living in that lake. Now, Loch Ness, the interesting thing about it is it is connected to the ocean with underwater, underground canals. So something can swim in from the ocean to, into Loch Ness and swim out again. But the Scottish people are absolutely convinced it is... These things are still alive. What country's flag is that? Wales. Why did they put a dragon on their, on their flag? You go to England, there's a town called uh, Carlisle. There's a, a, not a temple. Oh, what does it mean? know? There's churches? Church, cathedral. Yeah, I don't know. Cathedral of Carlisle. There was a bishop that lived there about 600 years ago. When he died, they, they buried him there in the ground. There's a big concrete slab over him, and then there's these copper plates. And on the copper plates, they made these engravings 600 years ago. That thing looks like a dog. It even has a dog collar on it. This thing looks like a fish, bird. That is, looks like an eel. And then there's this one. It's a bit faint, but it's two creatures, long tails and long necks. And those necks are like intertwined in the middle. So it looks again like these small sauropod dinosaurs. This is an ancient Mesopotamic cylinder seal that they dug up. If you roll it through the clay, that's the pattern it makes. And again, two creatures, long tails and necks intertwined. Again, it looks like a sauropod dinosaur. These are the oldest books in the British Natural History Museum, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. Those books are physically a thousand years old. 
They contain stories of a thousand years before that, during the time of Christ, what it was like on the British Isles. Stories of people who lived there, clothes they, wear, they wore, um, what their houses looked like, with what they farmed. Spoke about the, the animals on the island and dragons living on the island together with human beings. If we go back to the book of Job, that first dinosaur, the behemoth, the long neck and the long tail, God spoke further concerning this creature and he told Job, he lives in the shelter of the reeds and the marsh. That's why people think it must be a hippopotamus. And then God said, behold, if the river is turbulent, he is not frightened. Now the river God is referring to is the river Jordan, which get at some spots up to 10 meters deep. And God says the river Jordan is in flood and this guy is not frightened. He's just standing there gushing in the water. Now the biggest marsh on earth is the Congo Basin in Africa. Now when Belgian conquered the Congo, annexed it in, I think, 1885, around about there. They sent their missionaries into the Congo, into the jungle, to tell those people there about the Lord Jesus Christ. And then funny stories started coming out of the Congo as they started to communicate with these people in the bush. And those people there, 100 years ago, drew pictures on the ground of long neck, long tailed dinosaurs living in the swamps. Those stories reached America and Europe, and newspaper articles started coming out. This was in 1919. The inhabitants call those creatures mokeleme membe. It means the one that stops the flow of the river. They say they're extremely dangerous. They chase hippos away, crocodiles away, and then they tell the missionaries that their parents and grandparents, great-grandparents, at some stage were able to catch a small one. They killed it, and they ate it. So that's the stories coming out of the Congo. Still from time to time, there's these expeditions going in there to find the Congo monsters, but they haven't been successful until now. North America, let's go there. A painting or carving that the Indians made, if you give it an outline, it looks like that. Again, long neck, long tail dinosaur. Here is one of Edmontosaurus, a carving that the Indians made. And another one in Utah, again, long neck, long tail. And then this one was discovered also in Utah in the Black Dragon Canyon. Now it is of a creature, it's got two legs there, the body there, the neck, and then it's got a, a head, the bump on the head and the mouth, looks like a snout. And then, I don't know, it looks like wings or stuff here at the side. So if I show that to children, they usually tell me, sir, that looks like a pterodactyl, specifically the head with a bump on it. In the previous talk, I referred to Dr. Mary Schweitzer, who discovered soft tissue and, and dinosaur bones in 2005. Already back in 19, I think it was 1994, she discovered red blood cells in T-Rex fossil. And she said, it was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone, but of course I couldn't believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones after all are 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? Everybody knows blood cells doesn't survive that long. They actually break down pretty quickly. She published the findings in Science, very prestigious uh, scientific journal, and she got extremely criticized by her peers worldwide. How dare you say you discovered red blood cells? Everybody knows red blood cells cannot survive for 65 million years. That cannot be red blood cells. So when she discovered red blood cells again in 2005, she didn't say she discovered red blood cells. She said she discovered something that looked like red blood cells because she didn't want to go through that uh, uh, bad criticism again. But can you see how backwards the way of thinking is? What you should do is, wow, I've discovered red blood cells. It means this fossil cannot be millions of years old. But what they do is, they say, no, 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 we know the fossil is millions of years old. That's why it cannot be red blood cells. So can you see what a hindrance evolutionistic thinking patterns are to proper science? So what the people and the Bible, when they refer to dragons, you know, the old days, Bible, old books and so forth, it's just what we would call dinosaurs today. So it's the same creatures, but we just changed its name, its name about 100 and. Uh, 80 years ago. So then the big question that everybody always asks me is, what happened to the dinosaurs then? Because obviously you don't find them today anymore. The easy answer, they died out. Did you know it's not only the dinosaurs that have died out over the years? Lots of things die out. Why do things die out? Because we live on a cursed, broken, fallen world. If I ask children, how did the dinosaurs die out? The number one reason, meteorite. 
when that big rock fell on the earth. No, there's people that come to the office, mothers with six, seven-year-old children, and tell us, you don't have to be afraid. I don't expose my child to evolution. And then I tell them, mom, bad news. She's already exposed to evolution. Watch this. And then I ask her, tell me, little girl, what happened to the dinosaurs? Your womb is when that big rock fell on the earth millions of years ago. <laughs> then that mother's eyes go like this. What? Who taught you that? Walt Disney. Children are already evolutionized. So you're not going to protect them from evolution. What we suggest is expose them to evolution, but at the same time, give them the correct biblical answers. Show them and teach them how to think critically, how to think from the Bible. A lot of Christians think that dinosaurs died out with Noah's flood. Like this guy said, oh, great, was that today? <laughs> so, <laughs> so no, <laughs> they didn't miss the boat. They were on the ark. But what we should keep in mind is that life after the flood were very different than before the flood. I referred to it in my previous talk. When they came off the ark, God came to Noah and he said, The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the earth and all the fish of the sea. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. So from that day forth, human beings were allowed to eat meat. So that could be one of the contributing reasons why dinosaurs died. Out. Just think of it logically. If you can kill one of those big creatures, you will have enough meat for the whole village. That's easy. Is it easier to kill one big animal or go and hunt a hundred red buck, spring buck? I mean, it's much easier. Just kill one big thing. There's actually a video on YouTube. It's very gross to go and have a look at. But people up in Africa killing an adult elephant with spears. They spear that thing until it bleeds to death. It's gross to have a look at, but it is possible. Another thing is, as I said earlier, oh, maybe just other contributing factors is it could have been genetic sicknesses, diseases, mutations. The habitat was quite different after the flood. So a lot of contributing things that could have led to the demise of the dinosaurs. But as I said earlier, we should remember not only the dinosaurs died out over the years, lots of creatures have died out. I think one of the most famous ones, the dodo. About 400 years ago on the island of Mauritius, couldn't fly big birds, something like this, couldn't fly. The sailors got there. Bird wasn't scared of human beings. They walked up to it, killed it, ate it. Within a couple of years, killed all of them. This is the passenger pigeon. The last one died on the 1st of September in 1914. They stuffed it up, put it in a museum. It's called Martha. At some stage, they estimated there were 5,000 million of these pigeons, like 100, 200 years ago in North America, all gone. Southern Africa, the blue buck which the settlers and the foot trackers killed out. Quagga, that's the last living one of which they took a picture in Amsterdam in the zoo where he died in 1883. So the thing is, a lot of people thought in the old days, creatures can't die out. No, no, no. Things can't die out because God made them. He made everything very good. After the flood, he started over. So he kind of like supernaturally protected these creatures, plants. Things can't die out. The first guy who said, listen, I think things can die out was a guy by the name of George Cuvier. He was an amateur naturalist, French naturalist, and he said, I think things can die. Where, where's that creature? Where's that antelope? Where's that thing? I think things can die out. So back in their days, 200 years ago, they didn't realize things were dying out. So they kept shooting and killing until it's all gone. But today we realize things can die out. So what do we do to protect animals? The African wild dog, the panda, the tiger, what do we do? Put them in cages, put them in zoos, wild parks, nature reserves, protect, protect, protect. But back in they, those days, they didn't realize it. They just kept on killing until everything was gone. Then also over the years, a lot of creatures were rediscovered, but which people thought these things died out millions of years ago. And then they discovered the real deal again. The most famous one, the coelacanth, which scientists for years said died out with the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And great were they surprised when they caught a living one of the east coast of Africa in 1938. And the surprise were even bigger when they realized, but why does this one, that one looks exactly the same as this one. Why didn't it change for 65 million years? Oh, we know why. We know, we know. Because this creature is so well adapted to its environment, doesn't need to change. That's their explanation. So they call these things living fossils. 
Now, our explanation why the creature looks exactly the same as the fossil is because that guy fossilized probably with Noah's flood about four and a half thousand years ago. That's not so long ago, so you wouldn't expect the creature to change much. That's why the living things still look the same as the old ones. It is one that they discovered in 1994. A guy went hiking in Sydney, Australia, in a canyon, came across the Wallamy Pine, which they thought died out like millions of years ago. And there's the living one. It looks exactly the same as the fossil. The people's explanation? This tree is so well adapted to its environment, it doesn't need to change. There are millions and millions, thousands of these examples. Owls, insects, fish, frogs, whatever you can think of, where the fossil looks exactly like the living one that you find today. Our explanation, they just probably formed with Noah's flood only a few thousand years ago. So what we tend to do is, we tend to say, you know, how do you fit dinosaurs into the Bible? But that's actually the wrong way of thinking, because if you think that way, you think in terms of evolution, millions of years, death before the fall, dinosaurs and man did not coexist. So what we should do is we should start our thinking from the Bible. Let's give the Bible an opportunity to explain to us what we should do with the dinosaurs, because if we start our thinking from the Bible, we think in terms of only thousands of years, no death before sin, dinosaurs and man, and man created together on day six, Originally, they were vegetarian, and most of those fossils probably formed during Noah's flood. Now, the world is very effective today to use dinosaurs to turn kids, children specifically, into atheists. That's very easy. This is how you do it. Children, look at the dinosaur. Now, show me a child that doesn't like a dinosaur. Look at these dinosaurs. Did you know they lived millions of years ago? That means the Bible is actually wrong. But what we do is we use dinosaurs to lead children to the gospel message, and that's very easy to do. The next time you take your child to a museum or he sees a dinosaur fossil on the TV, you can tell him, Buta, look at that dinosaur fossil. You know when that fossil formed? It was with Noah's flood. Do you know why there was a flood? It was God's judgment on sin. Do you know what is sin? It is when we are disobedient towards God. When humans are rebellious towards God. Do you know where that started? In the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve, Eve ate of that fruit. And you know what? That is why God had to become a human being to take that punishment on him when Jesus died on the cross so that we can live forever with him in heaven one day. Start with a dinosaur fossil, you end with the gospel message. So we, so we don't refer to them as dinosaurs. We call them missionary lizards. <laughs> <laughs> couple of resources, well, those of you who still buy DVDs, but there's actually um, videos on the website that is for free. You can download talks just on dinosaurs, pretty much a talk like this. I still have one book left, I think, at the back, the, uh, Dragons or Dinosaurs. That's also available on DVD, or you can um, stream it from the website. You just buy the code, you can stream it there. Most of our children books, dinosaur books, and then there's this beautiful coffee table book with the right pictures drawn correctly. The arc, the right size, dinosaurs there in the background. So when people come and visit you, they page the book, they say, wow, what are dinosaurs doing on the ark? Why is the ark so big? And then you can just give them the right answers and show them that, you know, it's written in the Bible, things that we miss. So that is dinosaurs. I don't know if there are questions concerning dinosaurs or maybe something else that you heard earlier tonight and still have a question, then you can ask me now. Because don't ask me at the book table. I have to help people with sales there. Yes. How did he provide so much food? He collected it for about 100 years. So just think of it, seed, dried leaves, dried, I don't know what, I don't know what it did, dried meat maybe. Some of those creatures maybe ate meat. It doesn't say which food he had to take on the ark. God just told him, get food for the animals. So small animals, only a few thousand. It's not like massive amounts that you will need. But he had lots and lots of time to collect it. Maybe they were able to make pots, you know, put it in pots, things like that. They were very, very intelligent. Um, I think it's the seventh generation after Adam. There was a guy called Tubal Cain, and he was a craftsman in iron and bronze. How in the world did they know those elements existed and he could use it? But the other thing is, how did they, how were they able to make a fire so hot that you could melt rock to get the iron and the bronze and the stuff out of those rocks? Those guys were very, very intelligent. I mean, look at the Tower of Babel. Look at the, the pyramid that got built. Look at Noah's Ark. They were very, very intelligent. We tend to think, again, because we grew up with this worldview, we come from apes and monkeys, we become more and more intelligent. Actually, the opposite is true. We were extremely intelligent. Adam and Eve, the most perfect people we ever made because of the curse, we're actually going on this downward trend where we are becoming more stupid and, you know, 
You're laughing. We are currently at the level. So stupid. We believe we come from monkeys. That's where we are today. But they were very, very intelligent. So I don't know what he did, but the Bible says he collected food for them and they survived for a year on that ark. You can ask him one day. Right, something else? Yes. Yes. I water vapor canopy it here. Yeah, yeah. It used to be, we don't, we don't um, hang on to that anymore. We actually let go of that a couple of decades ago. But the theory goes like this. On day two, it says God separated the waters on the earth from the waters below the firmament and waters above the firmament. So people thought, okay, it's like this water vapor canopy around the earth, and that's what collapsed during the time of Noah. That's what produced the 40 days of rain. But with computer models, we actually worked it out. For that amount of water to be in the atmosphere, the greenhouse effect on Earth would be so high that nothing would be able to survive. It will be extremely hot. And there's one of the Psalms that refer to the firmament, the heavens. It's not the atmosphere only. It included the heavens where the stars are because I, I forgot the sequence, but it starts on the Earth and it goes up. And, and But the Psalm ends and the stars and the water that's above the stars that will remain until the end of time or something like that. And we know that the water in Noah's flood collapsed with the flood, but Psalms, the book of Psalms, were, were written after Noah's flood, and there it says there is still water at the end of this universe, wherever that is, in what form, ice, I don't know, but the Bible says there is still water at the end. So we let go of that, that um, idea of this water uh, atmosphere, because people also said with this water vapor canopy, the sun's UV radiation wouldn't have been so bad on human beings, that's why they grew so old. But we let go of that one also because there's a genetic explanation why the people grew so old back in the days, but not anymore today. And that has to do with the fact that men can father children until the day they die. But the older a man are, gets, the more mutations are in his sperm cells that you will carry over to your next generation. And we know the Bible says that Noah was 500 years old when he had those three boys. So we just think he had much more mutations that he gave to his sons. That's why after the flood, Noah still reached 950 years. So if it was something externally, why did Noah still survive until 950? But suddenly his son only reached an age of 600. His grandson only 400. And it went down and down and down and down. So we think it's some kind of a genetic thing that, that occurred there. So we don't, yeah, we let go of the water vapor canopy theory. But literally there's also, I think, a chapter or definitely a reference in the Red Book concerning that. Or just on the website, type in water vapor canopy and then there are articles on that. Okay, one final question. There, yes. The best version of the Bible. Well, our ministry, I don't know why I haven't read really up on it, but they use the English Standard Version. I like the New King James Version, personally, and I have an old Afrikaans version. So I had a good, okay, the past word work. So I had a good um, explanation once. A guy once told me all these different Bible translations that you get. It's like cameras at a rugby game. So they all are focusing in on the game match there, but then when something happens, a certain camera can look better at it from a certain angle. Or this camera, the next five minutes later, this camera can focus in better on it. So personally, I believe if you have like two or three translations, just to help you understand what the text is. But we use the English Standard Version. I don't know exactly why. They give a reason why, but I never really bothered with that. I have a New King James Version. It works for me. <laughs> all right, thank you so much for coming. Master. Awesome, thank you. Please stand. So I want to encourage you guys to support, get the books, go online. This is life-changing, life-altering truths. So I just want to encourage each one of us, equip yourself, get the answers, and help others as well. So let me pray for us, and I'm going to release you. Father, we thank you for tonight. Lord, we just pray your blessing over Creation Ministries International and Peter and his family. Lord, we pray your blessing over, over their ministry and all they do. May they prosper. May the message go out. May people be anchored in the truth and come to Christ. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Awesome. Bless you guys. Have a lovely week.